Hey guys, this is Barrett and this is Jay Paisley. Today we're going to learn about what a tourniquet is and how to make one in case we don't have one. Jay, tell us a little bit about yourself. I am a retired Special Forces medic. I spent some time in a Tier 1 unit and currently I teach professionals and civilians austere medicine and how to shoot. Awesome. So Jay, I'm seeing a lot of people who carry uh, tourniquets every single day. Uh, as a medic, can you explain to me what a tourniquet is? I'm sure you've had to apply a number of these. Absolutely. Explain what a tourniquet is, what its parts are, and what we're looking for. Okay, so uh, anytime I look for a tourniquet, I, I prefer a windless tourniquet. This is a windless tourniquet, which means it has a rod and it's a strap system. Uh, there's two primary tourniquets to go to. It's the Cat T and the Soft T. Uh, both of them are what we call TCCC approved, which means that they do in fact have the data behind them. Um, this particular cat tourniquet here, this is a generation 7. You can tell by the nice beefy rod and the gusseted hooks here. Uh, these come out of the package ready for one-handed application. And the idea is that you twist this rod and it tightens up the inner strap, which in turn takes the slack out of the outer strap, and that's what will get you occlusion of a, uh, a massive bleeder. So when we put on any tourniquet, and in this particular tourniquet, it's a cat tourniquet, we like to use the adage, go high or die. So for this example here, I'll undo it and stick it on my own thigh. <clears throat> so I'm going to get it up as high as I can possibly get it. And for your male patients, make sure you don't catch their genitals up into the strap. And the trick to applying any of these windless tourniquets is before you tie the rod, I want to make sure all the slack is out of them and I got a good Velcro to Velcro contact. And right now it's nice and snug. I can barely get three fingers in there. And at this point, when I start turning the rod, I, personally, I'm going to immediately feel the pressure. And I'm going to turn this rod until I get the, until the bleeding stops. Now this thing's starting to hurt, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Once you secure the rod into the uh, locking bars here, I'm just going to throw that little flap over it, and it's good to go. Yeah, a lot of people carry just one tourniquet, right? Uh, and I think it's important to kind of walk through the steps of what an improvised tourniquet is and how to make a one proper. So you can use me if you want to, but go ahead and talk with us what, what you got in your hands and so on and so forth. Okay, I'll go ahead and use you for the example. So anytime I make an improvised tourniquet, I try to use a, a, a technique that requires the least amount of parts. So I improvise with uh, the one third rule. In this case here, I got a nice wooden rod, right? Right out of the woods. Don't use anything you, you, you don't want to lose. You don't want to use flashlights and magazines because you'll never see them again. But at the same time, this has to be strong enough to withstand potentially a tremendous amount of stress once it gets under pressure. Uh, as far as the strapping system goes, uh, I'm using an old military cravat right out of the package. They come at the optimal one to two inches wide. However, if you're going to cut up a shirt, I recommend that you don't do anything that's super elastic because elastic stretches and gets thin and may create a cutting surface. So we won't do that. So again, today, nice rod, nice cravat, one third rule. I'm going to tie the first knot one third of the way down the strap one-third of the way down the rod. Get it on there good and snug. And you're leaving space right here. I'm leaving a little space. Like I said, now that it's tied on, you can see one-third. One-third of the way down the cravat, one-third of the way down the rod. That, that's going to give us our, our, our gross measurements. Now, just like we did with the cat tourniquet, I'm going to place this tourniquet very high on my patient's leg, doing my best to avoid catching the patient's genitals in there if it's a male. I like to leave one hand width between this knot and the knot that I'm about to tie. And that'll come, in, come into play here in a little bit. Get my two throws. And just like the manufacturer tourniquet, I am going to turn this thing until I get hemorrhage control. Uh, now I can already hemorrh see... You have hemorrhage control! <laughs> you can already see we got a tremendous amount of pressure, but because I was smart with my knots, I can now secure this thing without having to lose any pressure. And this will stay in place, of course, until a higher echelon of care comes to relieve you. Now take it off. Now take it off. Take it off. Right, God, Jesus, take it off. Take it off. <laughs> so if you're doing a tourniquet correctly, it's going to hurt. Right? It's going to hurt like a son of a gun. So it's called tourniquet pain. It actually has its own name, tourniquet pain. And, and it, it relieves me, it alleviates my mind from the rest of the pain of me not having a leg or whatever it happens to be, right? So, so a good cue that you're putting the tourniquet on correctly is it should hurt the patient. We're not trying to hurt them to be mean, but the bottom line is we have to hurt them to help them. So if, you're, if the tourniquet hurts when you're applying it, then you know you got enough pressure. Sure. So one of the things that I always hear about people using for tourniquets, like in the movies and things like that, is a belt. 
Can you explain to me why a belt would be maybe a good tourniquet, an improvised tourniquet, or not so good improvised tourniquet? I'm not a fan of using a belt for a tourniquet. I mean, most belts, I mean, this one here is pretty rugged. Most belts, believe it or not, aren't that very, aren't that strong. Yeah. And the moment they get under pressure, especially with those big femurs, um, some of them will break and start to fray right out of the bullpen. But subsequently, uh, if you're able to achieve the amount of pressure and the off chance that you can, maybe you can with an arm, probably not with a thigh, you're going to have a hard time securing it. Most of these belts stop their notches, you know, six, seven, maybe eight inches down the way. And uh, once you do get that pressure on there, there's real no there really is no adequate way to secure the tails, even if you threw a windlass rod in okay. there. So what we tend to see is when people use belts, they may, if they're lucky, achieve some degree of hemorrhage control. But when they go to secure the turn, they can't secure it. They can't really secure it properly, and they lose a lot of that pressure That's in the right. process. And then they have to reapply the pressure. And exactly. Like so I always say a good medic can make a bad tourniquet work, but that doesn't mean it's a good tourniquet. Okay. So that's it on the belt. Thank you. I've taken a few classes, and I even feel inadequate sometimes in applying a tourniquet. Uh, what are some things that you can share with us? Uh, I mean, do I have to have medical training to 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 apply a tourniquet, do I have to have rehearsal? What, what would, I, I want to carry a tourniquet, right? I, I feel like it's more likely that I'm going to carry a tourniquet and use a tourniquet than I would be using my firearm. So, can you walk me through about uh, anything that you would, any uh, any tour, type of tourniquet that I would buy, type of tourniquet that I would stay away from, anything like that? Uh, absolutely. So, when it comes to training on a tourniquet, it's just like firearms. You got to get some repetition in there. But uh, <clears throat> most tourniquets are designed to be intuitive. They're designed to be easy to operate in terrible weather conditions and under a high amount of stress. That intuition oftentimes gives consumers the idea that they don't need to train on it. Well, you do. Uh, you do need to get out under some supervision by somebody with some experience to at least make sure you have that base application down. And then you need to go home and get some repetition in like you would with any other skill that you need to perform under stress. That's right. Uh, I want to make sure that people understand that if you're going to use a manufactured tourniquet, whether it's a soft TY or the cat, um, whatever your training tourniquet is, doesn't is going to take some wear and tear. It's no longer your carry tourniquet. Okay. So if you want to buy a training tourniquet, great. If you just and want the to soft TC for me is like the training tourniquet for me. It's like it seems like it's the easiest one to train with. Well, it boils down to preference. I love the soft tees. Uh, I love that whole uh, version of the tourniquet. It's a great tourniquet. I just by default happen to grab more cats than soft tees. Okay. So I personally rank them absolutely the same, and I'm very upfront of the fact that my preference is the cat. Okay. Um, but I'm also uh, very careful that when I'm training with the tourniquets, I have a training batch, and then I have my live batch. And if I'm a civilian, and which I am now, and I have to buy a lot of my own tourniquets, hey, I'd probably leave them in the wrapper too. That's my cue as a civilian that if it's in the wrapper, it hasn't been tampered with, and it's probably ready to go. That's right. You understand uh, some of the common myths when it comes to using tourniquets. Like I was always told that if I leave a tourniquet on more than two hours, that I would like lose my leg if it stayed on for longer than two hours. Can you can it help? Understand based off your experience, can you help me understand a little bit more about these myths? Yeah, sure. So tourniquets themselves don't cause the amputation of an arm. Generally, there's some type of pathophysiology that happens after you improperly place a tourniquet or you fail to follow up on your tourniquet. Compartment syndrome is a large factor. Uh, uh, volume of blood can get into an extremity, but it can't necessarily get out. And this is what happens when you put the tourniquet on to get hemorrhage control, but then you don't go back and retighten it. Now, it's, it's recently come back up for debate. Do we uh, transfer a tourniquet over to a pressure dressing? Those are, are, are medical provider level skills. And we're just we're just trying to we're, stabilize somebody. Folks like us who are at yeah. home, it's our spouses, our kids, our friends, if, or ourselves even. If we need to put a tourniquet on, you are okay to leave this thing on for, for quite a bit of time. In fact, tourniquets are used What's almost quite a bit of time. Quite a bit of time hours okay right it doesn't mean the emergency room is not going to have to do some work no doubt but you're going to be safe for a little bit so we in fact clinically every day in podiatry clinics all across the nation people put tourniquets on diabetics for several hours while they do procedures and they don't have any issues okay so it's not that it's safe it does come with an inherent risk okay every, all things medical come with an inherent risk however this has been generally proven statistically it's very safe for you to do with minimal training, and if you had to leave it on for a long amount of time, you're going to be okay. Awesome. Be your pants or nope. anything like that. We're going to pretend that Jay has accidentally, negligently discharged, boom, right into his leg. You peg it. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm going to come over here. I see that he's got a wound right here, but it's bleeding really bad. So I'm going to come over here with my tourniquet. Now, I can come over here. I've got to make sure that. He's, he's upset, but I'm going to make sure his genitals, right, are out, but high and tight, right? So I'm going to come over here and make this as high and as tight as I can. 
he doesn't like that. And I'm gonna take this now, when's less, and I'm gonna tighten it down as hard as I can. Keep so tighten it, and I'll tell you. Okay. You have hemorrhage control. I've got hemorrhage control. It's gonna stay unlocked in there, it's gonna go over here. From here, I may wanna call 911 where my phone is, and then if not, if I've got a fireman to carry him or take him off, I can go do that. It's as simple as that. I'm a Bible college student, <laughs> you know? I've taken a class, I've taken a couple of classes and that's it. So some pointers. Uh, it's gonna invariably take you some time to, to prep your equipment, Sure. right? Uh, some of the things you can do, is I, I, do, I don't ask folks to memorize pressure points, but some of the things you can do is uh, put a knee up on where you think, you know, like up around the armpit areas or up, uh, up in the ah. pelvic area. And you're not gonna get him control, but, but you're gonna slow it down a little bit. Cause we're not okay. worried about you losing red blood cells. We're worried about you losing clotting factors. That's right. So as soon as you're injured, your body starts pushing all your clotting factors towards the wound. You don't want to bleed those out early. So if the sooner you can slow it down and ultimately get hemorrhage control with the tourniquet, the better off the patient's going to be. That's right. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to turn the tables. Now, I'm not going to apply an improvised tourniquet. I'm going to allow Jade to apply the improvised tourniquet and see how long it takes, okay? So here we go. I'm filming partner with my gun, and boom! Oh, my gosh! I think one of the femoral. Oh, my right. gosh! Hey, are you hit anywhere else? Are you hit anywhere else? I don't else? think sit so. Sit still. Sit still. i got to put a tourniquet together. Oh, Stand by. I shot myself. I hey, shot somebody myself. go call 911. Tell them we've had a training accident. Let them know we got a gunshot wound, but it is not from a crime. It is from a training accident. So he's got the one-third principle that he's applying. He's going high or die. Gotta get about one hand in there. Make sure there's one hand between that knot and the wind's lass. He's gonna secure his knot and make sure that he's got enough space right here on this right here that after he's secured it and after he's gotten image control, would you have image control? <laughs> he's gonna use that to then secure it. Ah! All right, hey buddy, I want you to sit tight. We got 911 on the way. We're gonna take care of you. Somebody else get the evac vehicle prepped and I want you to send two people out to the driveway to make sure the EMS guys know where to go. Now notice that he has to, to make sure that this is secured. The further this knot is right here, the better off you're gonna be, amen? Yeah, absolutely. So, so sometimes what'll happen is when you're improvising stuff, uh, you may not get your knots right. Um, there's a technique where you can use the old Gatorade rings and slide it up here. Those are all acceptable, but generally speaking, unless you have a spare key ring or Gatorade ring, you're not gonna have that. So what I tell everybody who's putting on a tourniquet is take that extra time to make sure uh, the tourniquet is set up for success, uh, even a manufactured tourniquet, and chances are to go on much easier. All right, Jay, share with us a little bit about uh, your classes, your program, what you offer, and everything like that here in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, so uh, as president of Emergency Industries, we offer fully certified TECC, TCCC classes through the NAEMT. Uh, for you at home, we offer through the Crisis Application Group, which is our national membership program. Uh, Austrian Medical Course is local here to Georgia, but we also have an extended affiliate program where if you're anywhere in the nation, we will do our best to hook you up with somebody, a trusted trainer to make sure you guys get the medical skills you need. I wanna thank you so much for having me out here at the range on Atlanta and having me uh, and sharing with me a little bit more about tourniquets. I appreciate it.